So oh, welcome yesterday... to the recording of the board AMA then. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> All right. I put a link to the issue five that we were discussing yesterday in the office hours. Um, as we get closer to having an official new CentOS logo, um, there was one that was in the um, newsletter and we went looking at issue five and we actually liked one of the other ones in there better um, and gave feedback. Um, to the team who was working on that. So they're going to make the two-bit version that we asked for, and then we have the other version. So basically what we really liked was the rounder version versus the square purple version. I said a question through the Q&A. Should I just restate here? It was the one with the arrow, I think, that we talked about. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah, so it's round with um, an orange center and arrow. Jesper, I'm looking for it now. Yeah, I think in the last comment, um, uh, I saw there was still a bit of reference to the last purple one. So there may have been some misunderstanding there. Um, actually, I will propagate the image to CentOS logo upstream repos and close this issue in the next few days. That's the last comment I have. Oh, yeah, I mean, after. Under that, the screenshots are for the are for the purple one, not the one with the arrow. Uh, okay. At least that's the one I'm seeing here, but it takes a long time to load that issue because it has a lot of embedded images, so it could be weird. All right. Yeah, I, on. Yes, by all means, please have... ask questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can use the yeah, chat, the Q and A tab. You can raise your hand and speak, whatever you. I want. have a question. Yeah. Um, can, can can someone just briefly? Because this is being recorded, and, and I want to use this as evidence to some of my uh, bosses. Um, can someone briefly go over the end-of-life timeline with CentOS 8 and the expected uh, timeline? I'm sorry, CentOS Stream 8, 8 Stream, and uh, CentOS 9 Stream. Um, when is the end of life for 8 Stream, and when is the projected end of life for 9 Stream? So they are listed on the website. I actually have to look it up because I don't know. Of the I know it's, uh, it's fairly soon. Uh, 2024 for eight. I have to look up the exact month. My my brain says June, but the actual stuff is written. But the stream product itself is tracking the uh, full support slash phase one of the RHEL product. And so you can compare them off to the RHEL timelines where that's where the big changes are happening in the OS. And so those are the times when you can make big changes in stream. And then I'm not saying that there aren't big changes after there, because A, I don't work for Red Hat, and B, I don't predict the future. But that's where the big changes are expected to stop. Brian and just so, put a link in the chat. Oh, perfect, Brian. It. Thanks, Brian. But yeah, it's... Uh, the, uh, if you look at the rel phases in the link that Brian dumped in there, the CentOS end of life track the big first phase where the development is really happening, because that's where stream really does show its power. That uh, you, as a community member, can reach in there and you can ask developers to help tinker with the guts. And uh, there have been a number of community members myself included as a community member who have done that. And it's been great. Like, I I have loved this. I've been making terribly minor little picky changes, but they've been awesome. Um, as I'm sure Brian can also tell you, like I filed about 150 bugs earlier in the week about, oh, little picky package things. Because someone's got to be little picky package things. So in the interest of the recording, Brian is saying in the chat, we're putting the site to link for both 9 stream and 8 stream to the um, RHEL support policy, because it is going to be the full support page. Um, but that the day, actual date doesn't change. So for 80, it remains May 2024. Uh, does that answer your question, Robbie? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, and then Jasper is saying, I was just thinking of a comment 
to the Visualization 6 remark on very late kernel security patches. Does anybody have context on this? It was in the, um, the Virtualization 6 um, quarterly update in the most recent uh, oh, community yet. newsletter. I got to reread that. It's on blog that sent us that org. Yep. It's the same post that has uh, the stuff with the artwork sig that we were just discussing. Okay, so for the recording, this says CentOS stream is lacking important and critical security updates compared to the already released rel content. An effort for making CentOS stream more secure will be welcome. Uh, the latest kernel is lacking CV fixes delivered in the last 40 days in RHEL 8.6. Uh, so my hunch is that what's going on is what we've seen happen in the past where sometimes because of the way 8 specifically works, we end up with some content being delivered first in the RHEL point releases and only later into stream as a byproduct of how the 8 stuff works. My understanding is that this should not happen with 9 because the new process uh, actually uses stream as the feeder for L uh, instead of having them as kind of parallel paths. Uh, but like Brian could probably elaborate on what happened specifically here. I need to look it up in the build system and see what the order of things were. Yeah, my understanding is that there is a workflow weirdness with the kernel specifically in uh, stream. I haven't been able to get anybody on record for more than that, which I think is a little bit fair because like they're not exactly authorized to pierce the firewall but that there is something unique to the way the kernel is built in eight that their people are working on and that it is loosely tied up with getting the git forge migration over so that there is one workflow but brian has got video on brian help us out here no we don't have to read it <laughs> yeah so um just to give a uh kind of a, a situation here. Um, so if you remember, if you look in the stream nine build system, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, you can actually see RHEL maintainers performing all of the builds as, as they go. This is for the kernel and for other, other packages as well. For stream eight, we're still in the situation where we, um, just to, to, to give you a, an idea of timelines here, um, it's, it's like the same sort of content, but we build it in the RHEL build system first, and then we notice it uh, and push sources and get the get them built for stream eight, and so that's that's what is causing a little bit of, of delays here. Um, we're working on on the, the eight process to make it match nine a little bit better, so that maintainers would take control over the eight builds as well. Uh, but we ex like I would expect this. Um, I would expect the experience to be a lot better in stream nine because maintainers have direct control over uh, over the builds that they do. And I'll, I'll notice that there's um, I'll also note that there will be limited cases um, based on the, the CVE policy that we published in the stream FAQs and stuff. You may still see uh, individual CVE fixes that make it out into RHEL 9 before they make it out into stream 9. That's just a, a sort of a policy thing that we've we've had to deal with as, as part of CentOS stream. So um, again, we'll we'll do our best. Uh, to make sure that that stuff gets in, but the, uh, if it goes into RHEL first, it's a maintainer activity that they need to make sure that they update the packages on, you know, on a, a regular basis, and we're uh, we're tracking that. Do you think we could have a metric for like the time it takes some, for something to make it to a compose as like a metric we can track or publish somewhere so we can see whether we're getting better or worse by getting things out quickly? I, yeah, I don't think that's. I don't think that's a usable metric to track because every uh, every CVE is going to be handled differently. Uh, so you can think of a um, you can think of a CVE fix that is applied to the kernel and it applies completely cleanly in RHEL nine, but you know maybe the maybe that subsystem has been rebased entirely. We need to address the CVE differently in stream nine for future RHEL releases. That that may require a larger set of work, and so it would. I don't think we could get useful timing metrics based on 
you know, some, some patches may fast forward, some patches may require a full component rebase. We may want to handle things differently between future versions and the intermediary fix. So, <coughs> yeah, I was thinking maybe something because usually what happens is that the actual fix shows up in like the Git forge long before we have the package out, unless it's something embargoed, but for the non-embargoed. Mm -hmm. So I think the area where this gets a bit weird is when it gets committed there, you can, we can see the fixes there. Sometimes you can even see, see the packages in Koji, but they don't make it to a compose until two weeks later. Uh, and like, that's the extreme case, obviously, but I think that's probably the situation that makes people understandably empty because there's this window of uncertainty in the middle. So that's why no. I was saying there is something we can track so that we can show people that things are getting better. I think that would be beneficial, like, it beneficial for the project, it would probably be beneficial for REL because then you also have a metric to track on the business side. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to speak for, um, yeah, I'm not going to speak for Linux engineering or the business in particular, but I don't think that's a metric that we would actually, um, it, it wouldn't be something that we measure ourselves on in terms of engineering effort. Uh, we can okay. talk about like priorities and stuff because uh, we, we've communicated priorities about because if you fix a, a CVE in rel first and then, uh, you know, you have to go, go back out and do a patch or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like that's, we've talked about that in terms of priorities, but we can't set, um, we, we can't set like any sort of guarantees or deadlines or, or anything like that yeah. on that Y stream work. And so that, that kind of veers into that, that territory a little bit because maintainers are going to prioritize their work internal to their teams based on the, you know, those recommendations that we've given them. So, but I think uh, one thing I would, um, one thing I would also recommend, and this is a, this is more of a general, um, a general pattern that we can use. Uh, if you're really interested in seeing, um, if you're really interested interested in seeing the latest content as it comes out, uh, the the stuff that we publish to composes.stream.centos.org is totally okay for consuming in any number of uh, of cases. So your CI systems, you can consume directly, um, you know, all of that stuff. I know some folks have been uh, sort of unclear if they wanted to point at that content, but um, uh, but yeah, it's it's totally okay to to peek into what we're putting out on the composes and not necessarily waiting for the mirrors if you you know are interested in in that content showing up really quickly. Yeah, for what it's worth, uh on my on my side of the world, uh we have some deployments where we do use the composes directly and that that workflow is working fairly well. And again, for the recording, Brandon Conobi is saying on chat, it's probably better to talk about the roadmap getting related to use the REL9 process so things come out sooner, similar to nine's time frame. Um, yes, I agree. I think the nine process would be a notable improvement here. And if we can retrofit pieces of it or it wholesale onto it, that will make everybody happier. Yeah. It's my understanding is that the eight process was figuring out the right way and the nine process was then implementing the right way. And it's hard to retrofit a process, but until you know what that process has to look like, it's hard to build the process. And so it's... And I think we have a lot of work overcoming, you know, the issues that existed with the workflow for eight, because people don't realize nine is so much better, but they're still talking and complaining about eight. So I think we're making really great waves on moving forward. It's just taken some time. And my continuing plug for, I do love nine as a release. Um, if you can move to nine, you won't regret it. Uh, Neil is saying in chat, I don't think CS8 is going to benefit much from the improved process given how soon it's going to be EOL'd. I don't know. I mean, now to 2024, there's still a few years. So it depends on how quickly we could do it. Um, like if it were something done in the last six months, yeah, I tend to agree it's probably not worth it. But if we end up getting a few years out of it, that yeah, seems that worth, it, worth it. Um, well, so well, uh, one thing to, to comment about that too is um, the, well, like some of the, um, 
But some of the efficiencies that we're going to see, it may not be directly visible to folks out in the community, but it's going to be extremely helpful for rel maintainers who have to have like five different workflows. And uh, we're trying to make their lives easier so that, you know, they can get their work done in a, uh, a little more efficient manner and keeping track of fewer workflows and helping us out with the, the stream eight, uh, uh, producing stream eight artifacts in the same way that we produce stream nine is going to be helpful there. Uh, and so that's one of the one of the areas that we're focusing on, just to make sure that they have some uh, some breathing room in the number of workflows that they have. Yeah, and this is a good time to stress that rel maintainers are actually part of the community. So anything that we do that makes their life easier ends up making everybody's life easier here. Uh, we've talked about this before. That we definitely want to avoid the, the like us versus them approach that we've sometimes seen. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're all contributing to the same project and working on the same things, just from different angles. Yeah. And while we've got you, Brian, uh, so Secure Boot? <laughs> yes, Secure Boot. Um, yeah, I don't have any updates on that this week. OK. Um, yeah, eventually, well, well, you're going to have to sort that one out. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to love it when you have updates for that. Um, All right, there is some stuff in the Q&A tab, I think. Let's see. Oh, Neil was just asking about Secure Boot. Well, I guess we've answered the one. Uh, oh, and yeah, we've answered the already. Oop. Sorry, Amy, you were saying? Yeah, and we answered Jesper's, which wasn't there earlier, but Neil did put in another one. When are we going to see rel developers in a public matrix room and on the public mailing list? Which I think would be great because then it just, you know, goes back to David's point. They are members of the community. And I mean, I think I just saw an email from Florian like Tuesday. Um, I mean, I think some maintainers are definitely active in mailing lists and on some channels. Um, I think the spirit of the question is how can we have kind of a wider push to ensure that it's easy for maintainers for ad maintainers to access these public channels that they they're aware that these public channels are where a lot of the communications are happening and that they feel welcome there uh, and i honestly don't know what the answer to that is but it is something i would love to personally see and that one's largely a sort of a how your development team is constructed kind of question um don't want to mandate workflows on people who are being productive with their current workflows. Um, I, everyone wants more transparency. No one's against that, or if they are, they're wrong. But telling someone you've been working great this way, you're doing fantastic work this way, now work this other way, is a complex process. Um, you don't want them to feel like the great work they've been doing is somehow devalued, and you don't want them to stop doing that great work while they adapt to a new workflow. And um, I, I'd love to see more open, more places, more people, but I'm also really happy with the quality of technical work that's been being churned out and none of these people report to me. And so that's, it's very much a group leader, team culture management workflow kind of thing. Yeah, I'll, 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 like I'll, I'll pull back the, the curtain a little bit too, because there there's no single place that every realm maintainer hangs out internally either. Uh, like they don't all show up in a, a single room. And so like one of the things that we're trying to do and, and what I'm hearing the you folks ask for is just uh, make sure that maintainers are aware of the, the venues that are available to them. And I think we can we can make some progress on that for sure. Um, can I... Go ahead, Brian. No, I think that um, the the one thing that I would I would also say is um, like some of the some of the tactical level uh, conversations well, like things seem to be also going well at a tactical level in Bugzilla and on the merge requests as they as I see them come in. Uh, I think we want to continue that as well and make sure that um, you know the uh, the the posts that Florian does, for example, is is great for you know kind of high level and forward looking things. I want to see more of that. I also want to see us continue the, 
the tactical level discussions on the bugzillas and in the merge requests themselves because that that's been really uh, really useful from a, a rel subsystem team perspective to to have those conversations internally. So that's been going really well too. Yeah, and I think it's important to make sure that when they do show up, they are welcomed and just not hounded with questions because you wouldn't do that to another community member. So just because you know someone might be one of the rel developers, you shouldn't treat them any differently than you would any other CentOS developer. All right, going back to the Q&A from Anonymous. What is a technical worry you think about for long-term planning? 2038. Um, <laughs> that is coming fast if you look at uh, roadmap timelines. As let's say you're on a rel system and your company always buys extended update support. Uh, that means that rel 10 is going to be running in your environment in 2038. That's three years from now. So what is your 2038 plan? What are you doing to be 64-bit timestamp compliant in your database columns that are keeping track of system times because everyone used epoch time and, oh, it's 32-bit and it's buried in your database that no one has touched for 100 years. Um, this is coming, and it's coming almost immediately if we're honest about what our life cycles look like. And so for the stream perspective, I don't have to really care to like rel 12, but for our big picture long-term, this thing's gonna be buried in a mine in South Dakota infrastructure. Um, <laughs> we've got three years to sort this. And that's not a lot of time to audit weird embedded stuff. So yeah, that's the thing that worries me. Um, like even if you look at the uh, nine release notes, uh, the XFS on disk format changed in order to accommodate 64 bit timestamps with nine. Hurrah, thank God. I thought it was already doing that. Uh, so, yeah, and if you th yeah. think about it, there hasn't been a lot of hype about this. Yeah. You know, not like everyone was panicking at the year 2000. So maybe that's something we can actually lead is reminding people that this is happening and they need to audit their systems and be prepared for it. And to remember that no one turns off a system that's working just because it has bugs. And th there's a reason why the big virtualization solutions have their stuff certified to run DOS. Um, someone paid for that certification because they thought it was a valuable product marketing gimmick. That means that they think that there's enough people out there running DOS still. Dot, 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 dot. Are there other people with technical worries that affect long-term planning? Uh, I think I also worry about ECM signature migrations. Uh, as the crypto policies keep increasing the size of the key bits, the future policy is uh, 3072. Eventually, we're going to hit 4096. That's the top end of the uh, of the bucket on those, and we're going to have to move to ECM. Do we have ECM support in all of our weird legacy embedded stuff? How many of these smart card readers that you have sitting out there in the wild actually just assume that your card has an RSA key and not an elliptic curve. I, I worry about those. And Alexandra in the chat actually brought up Python. Anytime we change Python versions, you know, then all the other open source projects are like struggling to make sure their code is running on the correct version of Python that, you know, the OS is going to, and sometimes they don't match. You know, so from the developer angle, Python changes are really big. Yeah, in general, any kind of a migration where there isn't one by one compatibility or when there's changes in behavior, things can get iffy. And especially if that is coupled with a large OS release, 
for a lot of people that ends up being the watershed moment when they apply all these changes. So it doesn't end up being just the Python thing, but it's the Python thing coupled with 20 other changes that might impact their infra. Uh, so oftentimes, um, I think oftentimes if one has the opportunity, it is significantly easier if you can do like incremental evaluation of what's going to change. But for a lot of organizations, that's not an option. So they end up having to apply to effectively uplift their infra every four or five years and everything changes and it's a major effort. But yeah, for, for like future things specifically, I would like to see in general, and this isn't, this is maybe less of a less technical thing, but I would like to see in general that I push towards this, that we started with CentOS stream with eight and with nine to continue to have more more places where folks can collaborate on the projects, more entry points for the projects for people to contribute to, both for people with technical work and non-technical work. Like I think one area where we can we could definitely use some help from the communities on the documentation side. I would love to see a place where like people from the community can contribute to the documentation and like help with translations, help with content in a way that's more structured than what we have currently on the wiki, which is kind of a mess uh, in terms of like discoverability of content and where things are. Uh, and it's also a wholly separate thing because right now the RHEL docs and the CentOS docs are quite aligned. And I know there's ongoing work on these. Um, that is something that will make me happy to see. And going documenters are contributors. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Their contributions are just as important as code contributions. And they're also a great way to get involved in a community. You know, you and find probably. something wrong in the documentation while you're trying to install, put a patch up. You know, become a member of the community, even if you don't fix, you know, a code bug or anything. Fixing our documentation is a great way to get started and a very valuable contribution. Yeah, and there's, I tacitly believe that documentation fixes these days are more valuable than the code fixes, uh, simply because our code has gotten a bunch of wonderful unit tests that I keep getting baked in and keep finding more and more things that are wrong. And you can't build automated tests for documentation. And so it goes out of date and inaccurate and loosely messed up quickly. And there isn't a way to make a computer fix that. And so I, I love every single one of you that has ever contributed a single comma or a space to the documentation. Um, that is critical humans only work that helps everyone, especially me. And a lot of times it's that first time user going through the documentation who finds stuff that we just mentally pass by because eh, we know it. So we don't read it as thoroughly as someone who's just learning it the first time. And it is how we onboard new students to kind of the Unix way of things. Uh, the, the sort of the mantra is read the manual. Well, if the manual's not right, then telling them to read it is kind of a waste of their time. And so we want these to be right and up to date. So when we say, oh, it's all out there, you can go read the information. Well, then the information should be right so that they don't get the idea that there is this disconnect where we're trying to hide things or we don't bother to keep it right. It's just that it's so much work. And it's not a CentOS only thing. Um, you get so busy working on the code in open source that you don't necessarily update the documentation. You might do the release notes, but you don't think to go through the process of an installation to make sure everything's still up to date, all the links are correct. Or you wrote the new code updates and the documentations in another bucket and you just sort of forget to tell them because they've been so good at their jobs for the last decade that you're just used to not reminding them, oh, by the way, we've changed this huge workflow over here because they've been doing a perfect job in silence forever. And it's just, it's, documentation is so human that the more people that are on it, the more of a community sense we get of it and also just the cleaner it gets. Writing technical documentation is hard work, but it's also really rewarding when 
you meet someone at a conference, they're like, oh yeah, I did that thing. I followed your install guide and it worked. It's like, hallelujah, it works. Which kind of gives me an idea. Um, maybe we can get more involved in some of the open source days and um, interning type pro pro programs that are going on out there. Um, they tend to not want you know, the students to concentrate on documentation totally. But if we start having a list of easy first issues, you know, then we can start con adding contributors that way as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that is important that we do bring over and ha start having new contributors. Yeah, I always loved that. I think it was LibreOffice that had a list of like easy ways to get started in the project in various areas. And I always thought that was an excellent way to get people onboarded onto a project because it was a widespread of things you could do and went from like minor pet peeves to code changes, to documentation changes, to artwork stuff, all kinds of things. Looking at the scroll back in the chat, if we missed anything. Um, Oh, Alexander mentioned change them from mailing list to discourse. Uh, we do have a discourse for CentOS. It's not widely used. Like any, all I see in there is mostly announcements at this point. Um, I feel like this is one of those things where if the community as a whole decides the discourse works better, we can certainly do that. But my impression is that this particular community seems to prefer mailing lists, at least for now. And uh, Sean dropped a great link in uh, the chat for the work in progress docs. And Mike dropped a uh, what can I do for fedora.org link. Yeah, and I just clicked on that. That's really good. Oh, yeah, it'd be great. Um, for Santos. Yeah, I was not even aware that this link existed. And Ooh, I, 403. Like, oh. I got a 403 from Fedora. I know, right? Um, yeah, and even in OpenStack, we have something like that in our community guide is, do you want to get involved in this, this, or this, and you pick your path? Kind of a choose your own adventure. Um, but I really like this Fedora one. So maybe that is something we can look at. As we become, you know, where we've moved in the life cycle type of, you know, flow, actually gives us a really good opportunity to bring in new developers who aren't just packaging, that are coding and the documentation and everything else. I also, now Alexandra's got some documentation as well um, for the CICD. And she's saying we yeah, need to top that in somewhere. So, there's a lot of room for documentation. So the the RHEL docs team has been working on upstreaming a lot of their the RHEL manuals, which is going to be a lot of like usage type stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of documentation that is that we need that is CentOS specific that doesn't apply to RHEL. Things like contributors guides or you know stuff around the CI for CentOS or anything for the six. You know, um, that's all stuff that it's not going to come out of the rel documentation team so yeah having a place to tie all of these together would definitely be nice yeah it'd be kind of nice to actually just do a um i'm a big fan of in-person documentation sprints just get you know some of those rel docs people and a couple of community people in a room for a week and we do have a dojo coming. If you want to do a session around this there, we could do that. I am. I, I do want to get the um, a, a presentation at least about the RHEL docs work at that uh, dojo. And it might be, but it might be delivered virtually by um, the RHEL docs team is in, is in the Czech Republic. And I, I don't think they're going to be able to come out. So. But that could be something we focus for the next dojo that will be over in Brno. Um, or FOSDOM. Yeah. And I think one thing we could do is maybe bring, you know, like a couple nooks and monitors or get them from the Westford office and bring them over so that if we do want to, want to run through 
the installation process. We can do it there and follow yeah. along and do the docs. Is DEFCONF CZ going to be in person next year? I believe so. And I believe FOSDOM is. So. Oh, nice. So awesome personally, when we talk about hackathons, I kind of don't feel like this is a place where you do the final part of your work and like make a final commit to to the the, the repo, but it's more like a a setting where you can tie all things together, understand where sh this should go, and so on. So like you create all these initial things. But then uh, you go home, and in, in the calmness of your home, you can actually review these pieces, remove typos, and then make, make it work, right? So it's, it's not kind of where you do a finished product anyway, right? I agree, yeah. yeah. I've, I've done some, some doc sprints for, for GNOME, and that's always been my strategy, is to focus on the, the, the planning and stuff, because that's the stuff where it pays to have the in-person high bandwidth. Yeah, is my most successful hackathons have usually just been effectively large project management sessions. Um, yeah. So we actually just have four minutes until um, Troy and Carl will talk to us about Apple. So definitely filled up this time with conversation. And People just a reminder for everyone that we do have the office hours, which is the Thursday, the week after the board meeting. So yes, we, you can always, yeah, you can always log in um, with the link Sean mails out and have these same conversations. You don't have to wait for a dojo forum. Yeah, and if the time for the office hours doesn't work for you, let us know so we can change it and use a more suitable time. Yeah, uh, yeah. and alternatively, uh, a number of our directors are in European time zones, and some of them are on uh, West Coast USA time zones. So we can arrange for a couple of scattered things, possibly. Um, there are lots of options if there's people to talk to. Yeah, the, the time we select, I think it's, is it 1 or 2 p.m., I think, which is, uh, I'm sorry, one, my time, which is U.S. Eastern, which kind of nicely straddles U.S. Pacific to Central European, um, but isn't necessarily great outside of that. But yeah, as Pat says, like we can do one that's, you know, maybe terrible for U.S. Pacific, uh, but, you know, good for um, Central European, and then also good for, you know, spreading into Asia or whatever. Uh, just let us know. Yes, yeah, if there's folks to talk to, I can get up at one in the morning and chat. I can't promise to make any sense, but I can get up <laughs> at one in the morning and chat. So we should probably get ready for Carl and Troy, yep. but it's been yep. wonderful talking to all of you, and I hope things go well. Oh, Thanks, and Ryan mentions there's also monthly Steam office hours for about technical questions around CentOS 3 specifically, 17 UTC on the same day as the board meeting. Yes, I right. highly encourage people to attend those. They always found them really, really useful. All right. Hey, Carol, thank you for the questions. And thank you to everyone on the board for attending. Bye, all. Thank you. Thank you, all.